was Stacia Williams with my husband. I didn't know this was a radio show. We didn't discuss <laughs> stuff like that. I, well, hi, I'm George. <laughs> uh, uh, so, I always like to start with like a current event. Um, I turned 40. That's current enough. Yeah, you turned 40. Yes. Yeah. And I'll tell you this. It was the most amazing feeling. So, men... Oh, well, let me stop saying men versus women. Yeah, please. But... Please. When I turned 40 as a woman, I felt as if it was me stepping into evolving. I know that I've heard that for men, it's not the same feelings, but I felt honestly like this is everything that I practiced, everything that I learned in my 20s and in my 30s. It's now time to essentially evolve into that. So I, I had moments of excitement. As a matter of fact, when we, thank you for the surprise trip to New York. You're welcome. But when we went to New York, there was we went to Central Park. We did. And when we came down the stairs, there were these people that were on the what do you call those things? Like the the board things. Hoverboards. Yeah, hoverboards. They were on uh, with the hoverboards with snakes. I hate snakes and I hate spiders. Like. Yeah. No, I hate snakes and I hate spiders. But I saw that as a moment to overcome and conquer a fear. And I started to post the video that we took of it because I actually held a python. I held it. And now I didn't post the picture because before the church people get to churching, I didn't want it to be, uh, I didn't want people to take it as if I was embracing like that sin or if I was doing a dance with a snake, but it really, for me that in that moment, it was a moment of overcoming a fear that I've had since I was a little girl and a fear that I've carried with me. And honestly, yeah. So turning so, 40. So the fear you overcame mm -hmm. was by a tamed snake with people in the middle of Central Park. Mm-hmm. Which knew that you were gonna pay them what well, we paid them in advance for you to hold the snake, that this thing was gonna attack you. It don't matter. It that's don't matter how it happened. And see, huh? th so that's a lot of people's problems. They, <laughs> I, that's a lot of people's problems. <laughs> they want to put stipulations over <laughs> over your moment, on your moment. And for me, it's it, it, yes. I don't care if the snake is uh, tame. A I'm, snake I'm, is I'm still I'm being a snake. funny. I thought it was. A, I hmm. thought it was. I thought it was. It was a moment neat. for me. It was, yeah. it was, and to watch you sit there almost look lifeless by holding the snake, <laughs> yeah, you, you, yeah, absolutely right, you're right. Well, so I was able to overcome a fear, um, thanks to you again. I was in a place that I, I kept saying that I wanted to take a trip uh, to New York, yeah, um, and that was I was in a place that I absolutely wanted to be in turning forty. So it it was an absolutely amazing experience for me, and now I look forward. And even over the last couple of weeks. Uh, of being 40, I've kind of been really evaluating like relationships, evaluating how I handle things, evaluating like me as a person, not overthinking, but just being more, being more intentional about yeah. um, my relationships and, and about who I really want to be as I go into, and this isn't my second half of life because I plan to be around to 100, but just being more intentional, um, that's that's been an experience. Now, that part has been an emotional experience for me uh, because I think there comes a time where in life we arrive to this moment that the relationships that got us to where we're at, they're not the relationships that we go into the, the next part or the next phase of life with. And for me, letting go, because I am a loyal person, um, that's my character. That that was kind of hard for me, but it it I took those steps and yeah. I think that was turning part of forty because as I'm trying to get to the to the nightlife of you turning forty, you decide to um, have this realization <laughs> moment that I was forty years old. I'm like, no, no time out. We're in New York City. <laughs> You see the lights from the hotel room? You see that? That's the city right there. We're trying to get to the city, and you want to have this whole, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to call it coming to Jesus, but you're right, though. There, there are relationships that are going to get us to a certain point. 
Um, and then as you grow, either you grow out of the relationship or the relationships you grow together, right? Yeah. Um, and, and plants and things grow in two totally different directions. And that's okay. And I think a lot of times in life, we try to figure out how to justify growing in a different direction. Yeah. It's just that we just went in a different direction. We're no longer, you're growing that way and I'm growing that way. We're just not growing together. Yeah. And it's okay for us not to force this thing to be something that it's no longer. And I think that the, probably the hardest, that arriving at that moment is probably the hardest, especially like w- whether it be with, with friends that have been around a long time yeah. or even with family. Sometimes we outgrow our family. Sometimes we outgrow our best friends. And I think that that's okay. And as you said, it's not that it's a bad thing because it's growth. And I accepting that growth and, and going in the direction to where to which God has called you or to which you feel led and staying true to yourself. I think that's the most important part. So I don't agree with outgrowing. I, okay. You, oh, I, you can outgrow family. <laughs> Trust me, yeah. I've outgrown a few of yeah, mine and yours. But I, I think that hmm. that's a different meaning than outgrowing a friend. Because you can outgrow a friendship and agree not to never come back to the friendship or agree that we're going to love each other where we're at and move, and move on. I don't, how I don't, do you know, though? How do you know when you, how do you know when you outgrow a friendship? I think everybody's it's different for everybody. Yeah. Nobody's that's not the same for everybody. Nobody that when you if you outgrew one of your friends, it's gonna be a whole different reason for me outgrowing one of my friends. Why? Um can have anything to do with where you're at in life, where the relationship took you. Um to something major could have happened to one or the other one. It could have shifted that one's view. There's a number of different things why you can outgrow a relationship. There's no different than outgrowing um a boyfriend or girlfriend. And yeah. I say that slightly because I don't know if you, if you do this thing right, you can outgrow your spouse because you and your spouse are growing together. But you can't outgrow your boyfriend or girlfriend. No, I do believe that you can outgrow your spouse. If you're not doing it together. Hmm. And I don't mean necessarily doing it together or work together. I mean doing the, re- doing the marriage and the relationship together. If you're doing it together, a lot of times you're not going to outgrow each other. Well... I, so you can, and the only reason I say I believe that you can, and and I'm not saying that you can't take the moment or take the time to reposition yeah. and, and and basically sink back into each other, but I do believe that you can outgrow your spouse. Now, in doing so, I think that there's a responsibility for one or the other to maybe pause and again, re-sync in back into each other. But I think that it's possible because it's, it's, it's one of the things of if our situation, take our situation. I was in corporate America and in being in corporate America, I had a corporate mindset and the corporate mindset is you're okay with being capped. You're okay with the ceiling. You have that notion or that thought that there's a ceiling. And so your your mindset is to get to that the top of that ceiling. But you're never going to be an owner. You're never going to truly, you're not going to be able to have the opportunity to burst through that ceiling because it's not your vision. It's not your company. You, on the other hand, you're an entrepreneur. That's That's what you've been since I've met you. You've always worked for yourself. And so there's always been this disconnect of, Corporate versus entrepreneurship. But with that being said, as you begin to evolve, now with entrepreneurship, there is no ceiling. Because you are, you you set, the skies is the limit, as they say. But with that being said, with the skies being the limit and me being accustomed to a ceiling, had I not be, been willing to, and at one point I did get stuck. And you took a step back and said, okay, let me explain this to you. And you took, you took that step because you saw it as your responsibility to not leave me behind. But had you not acknowledged that, or had you not taken that step back, I would have been left behind because of what I felt 
what I what I had become accustomed to. What I'm saying is that with not everybody in what I was I wasn't wrong and you weren't wrong. So not everybody, but not everybody sees to take a step back or sees it their responsibility or their obligation to come back and say, okay, let me take, or even has the patience to come back and say, no, listen, this is what this could be, or this is what this is. And essentially then we walk together. All right. Can I say something here? Sure. I don't agree. Okay. Um, I think that in a relationship, in a marriage, that at some point in time, you're going to fall out of love. Oh, for sure. And you're going to be in love, and I'm not going to be in love. And then I'm going to be in love, and then you're not going to be in love. Mm -hmm. I think it happens early in the marriage. And You think it happens early? I think so because the understanding... There's there's a, there's communicational problems in every marriage, in the beginning because over time if you last through it it happens for a time. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean you don't love each other. You're just not in love. Right. But and the there is growth, a difference. But the growth in the marriage doesn't do. It has nothing to do with what I do for a living and what you do for a living. It has to do with what we decide we're going to do together. And what we're going to do together is the marriage, the family, and all that that comes around it. And the love might be there, but we might fall out of love at times. I don't believe I can outgrow you. Um, not if we're doing it right. The reason why some marriages might fail is because they might outgrow each other. So you believe that you can not outgrow your spouse, but you can fall out of love with your spouse? I, 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 I believe that there is times in every single marriage where there's one person that is not in love for a period of time. Not and all the time. I agree and I agree with that, that most of the time we're in love, right? Mm -hmm. We're in love most of the time. But I can go back in parts of our marriage where I was in love and you weren't in love. And I can go back to parts of our marriage where you were in love and I wasn't in love. I like how you do that. You put that off on me first. Well, and, it, it and can go back and forth. I mean, it, <laughs> it can go back and forth. It doesn't mean, but, but it's happening. That, that was smooth. Right? It's yes. happening, right? Yeah. And, 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 but, but it's but I don't ever believe, no matter if you, when you were working in corporate America and I was self-employed, um, that we weren't growing together. Yeah. Um, and so, because there's a, there's an alignment there, and regardless on what happens or what does happen, we have the same kind of belief system. We believe that God is the seer over all this whole thing, and I don't believe, and I believe because of that, if you center it around that, and you both kind of go back to that. Um, and I'm not saying it's off trying to preach, but it's just what it is, right? Mm -hmm. You can't outgrow your spouse. I, um, I think that, so I'll leave this here. Yeah. I think that you can outgrow your spouse, but if you don't see it's your obligation to take a, to pause and take the moment to basically sink back into your spouse, that's when divorce happens. So I think that when, I think that, and you're saying, we're saying the same thing there because yeah. If I'm growing and I'm not taking my spouse with me, that's my fault. Yeah. If she's growing and you're, and you're not taking me with you, that's your fault too. Yeah. Um, but that's hard. I mean, and that's hard for women to grasp that concept. And the reason being is because we don't, a lot of times, I, I feel that we don't see it our obligation or we don't see it our responsibility to come back and, and get our husbands because- Biblically, biblically, and it, it's been for women, or I'm sorry, for men to lead the woman, to lead the household. And I think that, you know, so there was a post that, that a recent post that we made, um, and it was a statement that I made. And the feedback that I got from, or the comment section, it was, I felt very attacked in, Number one, I, I know that I don't speak for all women, just as you don't speak for all men. But when I speak from this place, I am a woman. So it's common or it's natural for me to speak on behalf of a, at least one woman. But my thoughts are that sometimes it's hard for us as women to feel it our responsibility to 
if we have a vision, because God does plant visions in everybody. It's not, God doesn't just plant visions in men. There are, we even know of marriages where the woman had the vision and the man is essentially, the husband is supporting that vision and, and they're thriving together. There's several different women-led companies or, or, or visions out there. But with all that being said, I think that sometimes it, it takes a certain kind of people for to buy into that and to really grasp that. And our patients, we we are we spend so much. When I say we, we as women, we spend so much time trying to do all these other things, hold all these other things down. That we got to be responsible for making sure you grow with us too. I, no, I I. I, I. That can be said two things because mm -hmm. the weight that's put on the man is not the same weight that's put on the woman. True. And the weight that you bear is not the same weight that I bear. And and again, not speaking for all men, I'm just speaking for the man that's right here. And so in saying that, um, it's our responsibility to pull you up with us too. And I'm not saying that because we we grew up in church. Mm-hmm. And we saw what happened in church. There yeah. was a bunch of women there and there weren't a lot of men there. True. And True. those women were praying for their husbands to be there. And later in life, their husbands actually showed up there. So, yeah, some of the ways, this thing ain't going to be always 50-50, right? Um, but that same husband might have been working some Saturday nights. We don't know what was going on in those situations, right? And, and a lot of times that was the case. And, and, and But even if she is the breadwinner, right? And even if that is what it is. Mm -hmm. you can't ask for the same grace if you're not given the same grace because in a situation one situation where it is there's a lot of situations where it's not and it's just part of the, it's part of the thing we sign up for and now we live in this world where where <sighs> we live in a world where women want to take on the head of the household role <laughs> not necessarily saying <laughs> They say, I want to be the leader of the household. Mm -hmm. But the numbers are what the numbers are. Women are making more money. They're more educated. I mean, there are there are some things that... Over 40% of U.S. households, women can account. And women are the breadwinners for. But, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. But in saying that, we can't assign roles and then decide that, oh, you still got to take out the trash. I'm not, and trash is just a, a term that I'm using right now. Mm -hmm. We can't decide roles and you decide what you're going to keep and what you're going to say you're going to take. And, but, but at the same time, then we get to these situations and we talk about a woman being the breadwinner of the household. She's just the breadwinner. It's just not, I'm a woman breadwinner of the household. You're the breadwinner of the household. Mm -hmm. Because when we became married, it became one. It doesn't work one way and not the other. It has to be. It can't be a side responsibility if we're going to take one and not decide that we're going to take it all. So you're saying when it's convenient, essentially. Yeah. It can't be at convenience. It cannot be. Hmm. Not only can it not be that way, but we cause a lot of disagreement that way. We have a lot of young kids getting married that don't understand the roles of the household because they did change. When women, did, when women, when women got the rights that they got they should have never been taken from me. I don't even know how that we got oh, and all that. Come through, woman's advocate. Power, yes, right? come on, people, activist. People, right? Yes, but when they got the right to go back to work and they got these rights, these mm -hmm. were the things that came along with it. So the roles had, so there were things that had to change, right? I have to help take the kids to soccer practice. I have to help wash my laundry. I have to help with some of the stuff. I right? can honestly say, speaking of growth, this is a moment, and this is a oh, moment Lord. because <sighs> teardrop. This shows your growth because <laughs> God I mean, knows I did. When we got married, did I didn't think I was supposed to do that. I, I, I didn't, but... Oh, my gosh. But this I is like uh, a moment. But, but I also understand that I expect you to show up my, to the office every day and give just as much as I give. Because right? you do. Yeah. And I also can't expect that and decide I'm going to come home and you're going to cook my meal and do everything else I need to do. Because you can't. I, I, I understand that, happen. right? But I also understand that you can't come home and be like, I'm not going to take out the trash. Mm. Again, the trash ain't the thing. But you know what mm. I mean, right? Well, because that's kind of like a typical like, it is what man. It is, right? it, yeah. it, it is what it is, right? Yeah. And, and so we have to get to a point that we have to say, all right, what works for my household? Instead of saying, 
What's my role? Oh, I agree a hundred percent. But I want to circle back to you made a comment about basically husbands and wives not being in love at the same time. I, I oh, think boy. that so one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast is because I wanted to intentionally tap into and, and really kind of challenge those social norms. Saying that is there are people out there that believe that they've been in love the whole time. They believe that that's not possible. But in reality, if they're being honest with themselves and being honest with them spouse and, and, and really just being honest with themselves, there are times where you fall out of love with each other. And the best advice that, that we, that I personally got, um, maybe you can agree was when we were sitting down with a married couple, uh, during one of our discovery visits and anytime that I think we do a very good job that anytime we see an opportunity to get advice, um, with what we do in retirement planning, anytime we get a, a chance to get advice from older couples as to what to do, right. Yeah. As whether it be in regards to kids, raising kids or, or, or how to grow your financial portfolio, whatever it is, we take those opportunities. And there was a moment when we were talking cause they had been married for 60 years Yeah. and we asked them, or I asked them, what is the secret to being married that long? 60 years yeah. of waking up yeah. to the same person, 60 years of, of disagreement, 60 years of, of memory, 60 years of bliss, whatever that looks like. What is the secret to, especially in today's society, what is the secret to making that happen? And the best advice that I heard and the realest advice that I heard was don't fall out of love at the same time. Yeah. Somebody has to still be fighting. Yeah. Somebody has to still be in the fight. Yeah. Because when you're out of love, when you're out of, when you're not feeling it, when you're, I have to be willing to show up. I have to be willing to go the extra mile. I have to be willing to schedule those counseling appointments. I have to, and, and vice versa. When I'm not feeling it, when I feel like overworked or I feel, you know, unappreciated, whatever that looks like for in my seat. You have to be willing to do to go the extra step to show me that you are invested. You have to be willing to go the extra step to show me that I am appreciated. That's what it looks like to not fall out of love at the same time. But it in today's society, for everybody, it, it's it's not the same for everybody. But in today's society, it's to me that's again when we talk about the word divorce or when we talk about divorce, that's why it happens. Because we're not some, we're not willing to fight at the same time. The reason why divorce happens, because we don't believe in grace or forgiveness or any of the other things the Lord tells us to practice, mm. and it mostly comes from the woman's side Sorry. because no. they are unable to forgive us for the, the sins which we commit. It's not that okay. I'm, let me break down. But at the same time, no, that's not the we case. We can't live with y'all committing those same sins against us. No, but I want to back but, up. But what I will tell you is this. Hold on before you go there. Is that divorce is a hard thing to swallow. And I think it changes people for the worse because now you're looking for this inside of a person. Yeah. And a lot of times I listen to a lot of people that have gotten divorced and the divorce wasn't worth it. And they know it too. And sitting across from the table from people that got divorced, it was almost like the first time was the right time. Yeah. And and we sit down and we look at the things that we fall out about. Like, I look at the things that we argue about. 99% of the things we argue about shouldn't mm -hmm. have been arguing at all. Yeah. And there's nothing that we've argued about that I really would like to push my life over, right? And Absolutely. There, and there's also very few things that can happen in a marriage and two people that want to be in a marriage that can happen. And I'm going to say, I'm leaving you out. So... I once heard a message by T.D. Jakes, and 
in that message, he talked about, he talked specifically on divorce and his thoughts regarding divorce. And I'm not going to quote him verbatim, but I, I'm going to paraphrase. But essentially what he said was the reason why divorce happens or one of the reasons why divorce happens is because couples spend so much time in the beginning fighting over things that aren't relevant, the small things over who didn't take out the trash, who didn't cook dinner, which you're not getting in the beginning, which you're not getting enough of that. When it comes time for something major that hits your marriage or something, when, when something major hits your marriage, such as sickness or, or job loss or anything major or death, whatever that looks like, death of a parent, death of a child, there's no fight left. And that Lee, because there's no fight left on other either end because you're exhausted from those small things, that message resonated with me and really helped me to pick and choose about what I was going to fight on. Now, did I get it overnight? <laughs> no, but it really, when I think of the things that I'm going to pick an argument about, I, I keep that message in the back of my mind because the last thing that I want is when something major happened, God forbid. But even when we went through that, but that's, when what, I gonna, that's what I was going to say. Like, so today I, I went down to Terrell's thing. I got to speak in front of those kids, by the way, it was an amazing event, right? Mm -hmm. What he does is absolutely amazing. Um, but there's a gentleman that got up and spoke. He's a chef. Um, he just took over the restaurant that's in the Phillips hotel. Um, um, and he talked about perseverance. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning of the marriage, those things are going to happen. You're going to fight about all the little things because in reality, nobody knows how to be married if you haven't done it before. Right. That's why the people who've been married twice in the second marriage, they just kind of... But even when you've done it before, you know, on your second ahead. time, so you obviously didn't I mean, know how to... That yeah. don't count. <laughs> if, it, may, it may, but, but what yeah. I'm saying is like, you don't know how to be married to that person. Yeah, to that person. You're right. So That's good way those to things are going to happen. And then life's going to happen. Yeah. We went through job loss. We went through death of a parent. Yeah. And they weren't easy, though, either. And it's no. just about persevering through it and, 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 and realizing that there's something. We, we decided this is what we were going to do, so we did it. Yeah. And, but that's and, not for everybody, that thought. Is not for everybody. But it has to be when you say, I'm going to do, I do. Like, it, it really, like. It we, has to be, but I'm just saying, it's, hypocrisy is real. It's one of the things of what you, and I think that, and I can't even call it hypocrisy. Because the reality of it is, is we can't see tomorrow, right? We go into marriage uh, full of bliss, full of all the positive things. That's full because, of the like, world, because everybody lied to us getting to that point. Everybody true. said that it was going to be this, this amazing easy like thing that you're going to do not saying it's going to be the hardest thing you're going to do that you got to figure out how to live with this person they don't tell you the shit that's going to excuse me but they don't tell you the things that's going to scare the life out of you um so you don't do it mm -hmm. and i get it you might not do it but if you did it you may be better at it right like if a group of men got together with the man before he got married encounters him up to what he was about to walk into, it would get him better for it. If a group of women counseled it, we took a group of women and we counseled that woman up until the day she got married, she would be better for it. Because the things that happen right when you get there are the things that take you out in the first two years. But you know, it's, it's funny that you said that because when we do premarital counsel, counseling, it's typically with a pastor or a certified counselor. Wrong person. And I think, and honestly, <laughs> I can't, well, I don't want to discount the pastor or the certified counselor, but here's what I will say. I think that we do ourselves a huge disservice or do our friends a huge disservice when we discount their experiences. Because if I'm, let's just say this scenario. If I'm a newlywed or I, I'm on cloud nine, this is what I want to do. Oh my gosh, I'm in love. I don't see those flaws. I'm usually blinded by those flaws. Or even if I'm not blinded by those flaws, I've made it up in my mind that marriage, marrying the goal of marriage is more important than addressing those flaws. And so I have a friend that comes to me or a group of girlfriends that comes to me and says, Hey, you might want to consider this, or you might want to be watchful of this or be mindful of this. If this comes to your door, this is what I've been through. 
it, it I have heard of times where we we discount those friends or we said we we essentially stop being friends with those people because they don't know how to be happy for us in that moment. When in actuality, what you just said, I feel could be more beneficial in the long run because those are real experiences. And I'm not discounting, like, again, I'm going back to not discounting pastors, but the pastor's job is to be positive. The pastor's job is to see you through. Your friend's job, and more so for better, and I guess for worse too, but your friends, are they're going to give you that rawness. A pastor is going to give you scriptures because I look at my own situation, being the daughter of two pastors, there were times when I needed my mother. I needed my mother to reach back to before she was saved, or I needed my mother to relate to me in a way that, or, or in circumstances that might have happened before her and my dad got to where they were at. And my mother gave me the pastor version of her. And I immediately disconnected. So I think that from a pastor standpoint, it's they're going to hit you with scripture. They're going to hit you with what you should do. But your friends, I think it's huge. I, 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 it's a mistake to not listen and to not take into consideration that advice, even based off of what you just said. I think that that's where you should be getting it, 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 a portion of your advice, at least. Yes and no. If nobody today, I don't think. I don't think that we're doing marriage the same way we did do. So people aren't going to the pastor. Yeah, um, not not everybody. It's the problem that you face in your friends' relationship today, in friends getting together, is so much of their marriage is on social media. The thing in the point that you said that they're not going to listen to their friends. I think there's a way that you can talk to somebody and they will and, they, and without saying, "I'm not happy for you," I'm not, I'm happy with what you're about to go through. But this is what you're about to go through, because I think that the common thing in every marriage is this. After the honeymoon goes over, you get to know the person that you decided you're going to marry. <laughs> and even if you live with them before, it changes. It Marriage does changes. change. It yeah. does change. I agree. And you, now you have to figure out what each other's role is inside this marriage. Until you get to that point, everything, whether you're happy, you can be the happiest person in the world, but those things they eat at you because you haven't got that clear understanding, right? Yeah. Um, whether it is how they keep their closet or, <laughs> I mean, or, or their OCD about everything or, or if they. I'm feeling attacked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, 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 but those things are the things that everybody goes through early. Yeah. And, and some people know how to internalize them and understand that there, it's a growing thing. And a lot of people don't understand that. And it goes from being from those little things to a big thing. And then something happens, like you said. Um, but when that something happens, it goes back to either muscle memory or what you saw before. Um, and if you saw before your parents getting divorced, more than likely divorce is going to be the first thing that comes to mind. Not to say that divorce is the first thing that comes to everybody. I think that everybody goes to that point the first time or even the second time that they want to get a divorce. We say that because it's hard. Mm -hmm. But you don't do it because you knew it was going to be hard, right? And that's the thing that I think that people don't realize is it's going to be hard. Yeah. And if you understood that it's going to be hard, you're going to cry. Your feelings are going to get hurt. You're gonna feel um you're gonna feel abandoned, you're gonna feel um not understood. But in life, in some relationship, in some part of your life, you're gonna feel all those things. And if you decide that this is gonna be the end of a, a commitment that you decided you want to spend the rest of your life with this person because you feel one of these things. It's got to be a hard thing to swallow. So given there is no manual to marriage, because there isn't, 
there's nothing and, and even if somebody shares with you advice and as I mentioned I don't think that you discount the advice but you don't know until you know right you don't know until you're in that moment you can brace yourself there, but until you're actually in that moment so with that being said like what is a piece what is the best advice that you can give to people that I they're considering marriage they're in marriage whether it be their first year marriage or what they feel is going to be their last year of marriage what is advice that you would give to to the to that person Hopefully everybody listening to this is Christian, right? It is faithful. Well, the reality is. is everybody It's not. It's not. And that's But here's what I want to give you is this. Is the most triumphant people in the Bible had the hardest things to go through before they became those triumphant people. Hmm. And whether it's marriage or anything else in life. We decide that we don't want to go through the hard stuff to get the good stuff on the back of the hard stuff. And the faster you can take in, and the hard stuff is going to be different for everybody. Mm -hmm. Because we went through, I think, every hard thing you can possibly dream of going through. That devil is a lie. Because there's some we hard did not. things. I, I've seen some <laughs> yeah. hard things. Well, I'm we went through is, some hard things, we but not some everything. Hard things, right? Yeah. And the faster you realize that marriage is going to be the hardest thing you're going to do and you're going to have to go through those hard things, yeah, the better you're going to have in processing when it comes and the better you're going to have a better idea of, of, of just dealing with it because then you figure out how, how do I fix this problem yeah. instead of saying this problem is the end of the marriage. Yeah. yeah. Because even if it's not the end of the marriage, by you taking that energy in, it just lasts the problem out a couple more weeks. Some of the best advice that I received from a friend, and it was listening to that friend go through their own trials of how do you know when it's time to leave or how do you know when it's over, truly over? And the advice she received and had internalized and she passed on was, you know that it's time to leave when you have focused on becoming the best version of you. And you can honestly say, that this is the best version of me that I can give. And if it's still not good enough, it's time to go. I think that marriage relationships should, it is about considering the other person's feelings, but the reality of it is if you are not constantly or consistently working on becoming the best version of you, and, and this goes beyond marriage and relationships. This goes in with your career. How do you know when it's time to go? How do you know when this isn't it? If you've become the best version or if you've given the best that you can possibly give to that situation and it's not turning around, it's not becoming something different, you're not evolving, you're not growing anymore in it, it might be time for, it might be time to go. So with that being said, thank you for joining us. If you haven't already, be sure to, to subscribe because it is our goal to continue to cover a lot of these untapped topics. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.